Hello and welcome to Let My People Think, where this week, Dr. John Dixon is filling in for Ravi Zacharias. Dr. Dixon is the founding director of the Center for Public Christianity in Australia. And with a degree in theology and a doctorate in history, he is uniquely qualified to answer one of the most troubling questions about the Bible, that of violence in the Old Testament. Here's John Dixon with this week's message. The first thing I want to say of six is simply this. Friends, concede the problem. Concede the problem. Um, there are some extremely difficult things in the Old Testament. I wince when I read some Old Testament stories to my young boy. Now, that may partly have to do with my sort of protective, middle-class, comfortable culture. But I think even still, there are some, frankly, horrible things in the Old Testament. The Old Testament contains things that would push the R rating level in films to the utter limit. Secondly, you can't separate the stories from their explanation. I think this is something you can say quite firmly to our skeptical friends. We need to point out that you can't pick a horrible story from the Old Testament without also accepting its narrative explanation. That's not fair. Now, this won't completely eliminate the problems, okay? Let me make that clear. But it does set the problems within a framework that makes them a little more understandable. Take the issue of the conquest of the land. Here's Richard Dawkins. He says, The ethnic cleansing begun in the time of Moses is brought to bloody fruition in the book of Joshua, a text remarkable for the bloodthirsty massacres it records and the xenophobic relish with which it does so. But a careful reading of the Old Testament provides a very different perspective. The narrative in the book of Joshua makes crystal clear that ethnicity has nothing to do with the conquest. In fact, in an ancient context, Joshua chapter 5 amounts to a deliberate repudiation of the normal understanding of a tribal conflict. In antiquity, this is what the meaning of this story in Joshua 5 is. You know the story. They're about to go and invade the land. This is the moment where they're about to be victorious, where the promise is to be fulfilled. And the angel of the Lord, the commander of the Lord's army, something, this is a, a revelation of Jesus, a Christophany. Um, we don't know. But the question is put to the commander of the Lord's armies, are you for us or for our enemies? What's the reply? Neither. And this is deliberately placed at the front of the book of Joshua to dismiss any notion that this has anything to do with God playing favorites, to do with ethnicity. The correct interpretation of the conquest is enshrined in Israel's law. Deuteronomy chapter 9 makes clear, After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, The Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going to take possession of their land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations. The Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers to I Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand then, third time, that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving this good land to possess, for you are a stiff-necked people. This is extraordinary in an ancient context. If you read ancient literature, this is not the sort of thing you get. This is actually a critique of the notion of ethnic cleansing, of the notion of tribal warfare. The explanation here has nothing to do with genocide, Nothing to do with racially motivated destruction. It is to do with the judgment of God on the Canaanites. And remember, God ultimately judges Israel as harshly as the Canaanites. There is no favorites with God. The ethnic cleansing criticism just can't stick. The other thing that's worth noting about the narrative context of the conquest is that in Scripture, this is a particular moment in history. It was a particular action in a particular time for a particular situation. It is not repeated. In fact, unlike other conquesting nations from antiquity, there's no evidence that Israel ever tried to um, extend their borders beyond that promised land. 
It's not like they then went down and tried to take over Egypt and so on. It isn't a conquesting people. They understood themselves to be the divine instrument of exacting judgment on a profoundly wicked people. That is the narrative context. If you're going to take a story, as Dawkins does, you have to take its narrative explanation. Thirdly, and very importantly, just because a story appears in the Old Testament doesn't mean that it is approved of. Um, Often the opposite is the case. If Dawkins and co. had bothered to read a single commentary on Genesis or Judges, from which they draw their best information, they would have discovered that one of the dominant themes of Genesis and Judges is precisely the wickedness of Israel and the kindness of God nonetheless. Um, It is an oddity in antiquity that the biblical heroes are mostly anti-heroes. The logic of the Bible isn't look at Moses, look at David, look at Israel itself and copy them. No! It's look at how God is still gracious to these wicked sinners. For example, there is no way the narrator of Genesis 19 wants you to extract a moral example from the story of Lot handing out his two daughters in exchange for the, you know, for the host, uh, for, the, uh, for his guest rather. He's acting wickedly. And uh, the town is not saved on account of uh, Lot's righteousness. And Lot isn't saved on account of his righteousness. We see in the scriptures, Genesis 19 and 29, that it's on account of Abraham that God saved Lot and his family. But what about Abraham himself? Dawkins says this is a morally suspect act. Abraham willing to sacrifice his own son. Well, look, at one level, this is morally suspect. Okay, you should be arrested today if you try this one. But go back into the narrative. The point of the story in an ancient Jewish context, in an ancient Mediterranean context, is precisely that God forbids child sacrifice, for he will always provide the sacrifice. That's what the story means. And although we could quibble over the psychological damage this did to poor little Isaac, (laughs) I bet you if Abraham and Isaac were here, They would be praising God that through this dramatic moment, this teaching was branded into the mind of Israel. God does not require child sacrifice, as many of the nations around them did, certainly the Canaanites. This is a deliberate setup story to say this is not how things work in the divine economy. Then there's the Jephthah incident in Judges 11, which Dawkins makes much of again. Uh, You know the story. Jephthah basically says to God, you know, if I beat these enemies, then I'll offer you as a burnt sacrifice the first thing that I see when I come back. And it happens to be his daughter. So he goes ahead with it. And, of course, Dawkins makes much of this. Yeah, there's the morality of, you know, the the biblical uh, paradigm. Um, Jephthah's action is clearly not approved of in the book of Judges. He is actually an example of someone who made a rash vow. In the Hebrew scriptures, in the Old Testament, um, the Torah names a thing called a rash vow that can be overturned. This is one such rash vow. And had the Torah been operating correctly in Israel in the period of the judges, it ought to have been overturned, but it wasn't, and that's the point. Israel is descending into this bizarre kind of religion. Uh, The same can be said of the most gruesome of all stories in the judges. I hardly need to describe it, but if you want a pretty nice description, either read the original or go to The God Delusion where Dawkins waxes lyrical. Um, What Dawkins doesn't mention is the whole point of Judges, particularly this climactic, terrible incident of um, the concubine who's handed over, raped to death, and then she's chopped up into 12 pieces and sent to the tribes of Israel. 
is that Judges is making the point that Israel is wicked. And it's a point that um, comes in this recurring and climactic phrase in the whole book of Judges. How does the book of Judges end? There it is, 21-25. In those days Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. That's the point of the book of Judges. Uh, My Old Testament uh, teacher, uh, Barry Webb, uh, from Moore College, who got his doctorate at Sheffield in the book of Judges, uh, makes a a wonderful case, uh, and I commend his work to you, Barry Webb. I can't remember the title, but it's the book of Judges and it's Sheffield Academic Press. Makes the point that Judges is all about the unravelling of Israel's institutions to the point of absolute degradation. My main point here is that the new atheists do us a deep discourtesy by not bothering to read the Old Testament carefully. If I went out to criticise a scientific theory, I guarantee I would not just try and pick some unrepresentative data without also trying to understand the background theories and the models that scientists use to understand the data. You don't find that kind of approach toward the Old Testament in the New Atheists. Fourthly, and I'll just make this point very quickly, Israelite laws about warfare, social ethics and punishments are infinitely more just and compassionate than those of their ancient Near Eastern neighbours. And any ancient Near Eastern historian will agree with that. Old Testament scholar Alden Thompson speaks of God incrementally humanising the ancient Near East through Israel. For time's sake, um, and partly because I don't think this is a very powerful argument, I'll do nothing more than just point your attention to uh, an important article by Paul Copan, uh, Is Yahweh a Moral Monster? in uh, Philosophia Christi. There's the uh, volume 10, number 1, from 2008. The fifth thing I want to say about the problem of Old Testament violence is this, and it relates to something I said in connection with homosexuality. The violence of the Old Testament uh, must be read through the lens of the New Testament. The point here is that some rays of Old Testament light are refracted through the Christ event into the New Testament with little change. The sexual ethics of the Old Testament are an example. Some rays of Old Testament light are in fact intensified as they come into the New Covenant, such as love your neighbour becoming love your enemy. And some things in the Old Testament are refracted beyond recognition as they enter into the New Era. And among these concepts are holy war, theocracy, and temporal judgment within time. I'm not saying God doesn't judge ever in time now, but where is that the default position in the Old Covenant? The judgment has been suspended to the day of the Lord in the New. Christians can never validly say that a conquest or violence of the Old Testament provides justification for so acting in the New Covenant. This flies in the face of the new atheist default position, which is, it's in the Old Testament, therefore Christians believe that that's how you should act, which is basically how their argument works. That does not pay us the courtesy of reading the scriptures the way we have always read. This is not smoke and mirrors designed to help us pick and choose which bits we like. This is how the church has always read the Old Testament. Apart from some fringe groups, historic Christianity has never read the Old Testament as a direct revelation to the people of God in the New Covenant. 